Um, we're about to have one of them conversations I just enjoy having because we've got one of them guests that you don't see very often. Like he makes his appearance here and there, but when he makes his appearance, his appearance is felt. This man got so much history in the music industry, and I'm looking forward to having one of them good old fashioned music conversations and just learning from this icon in the music industry. Please welcome one of the best managers to ever do it in the hip hop game. Matter of fact, hip hop, R&B, just in the music game. <laughs> Michael Blue Thank Williams. Blue, what you, up, Chris. man? Thank you, man. I appreciate, appreciate the kind words, man. I really do. Pleasure to be here. You, you know something? It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, I've been wanting to get you on for a while, actually. And, uh, you know, just having you in the building, I know that this conversation is going to help a lot of people who's aspiring to do all of the things that you've done in your career. So thanks for making time for us. Man, look, I, I, a long time ago, someone taught me this information, the knowledge, the experience that we learned, they're not meant to be kept to ourselves. It's selfish of you to, to garner a bunch of information, learn how to do things, and then just take it with you or keep it to yourself. And so for me, anytime I can talk to somebody, I can share some, that, that's really how I feel. I don't feel like this is mine to hold. I think anything that I've learned in now my 30 years in industry, if we can help somebody get through that next step or hearing the story, I'm happy to share that information. Yo, you want to know something? That that's a that's a really good way, um, and, and a great outlook to have on life and on business. I, I remember when I was interning in the '90s, and I was trying my best to get in the music industry, and I was taking internship after internship, and I couldn't get a job to save my life. And the reason being, it was because people felt just the opposite of what you just said. They were so afraid to pass on information. They were so afraid to share and to help somebody else get in, not realizing that if you help somebody up, that person's indebted to you for the remainder of their career. So oh, yeah. just hearing you say those words, that, that's a great way to look at life and that business to to i i've often felt and maybe it's because i'm six five and maybe because i look at life i think maybe from a different perspective and, I, and i've always played sports so i'm used to being a team player but selfishness just isn't in that sense isn't who i am and, and it's, it really you keep people out or you block somebody from getting in you may have blocked your next set, set of blessings when you expand and you give people their chance uh, these people I talked to that I might have had two conversations with in 1998. And in that conversation, though, it struck a chord with them. And now we're circling back and they're vice president of some company. But that conversation, that opportunity, it circles back. I'm starting with a head start with whatever I'm there to see them with because I put good energy out. The, the, the worst thing I tell managers is I'll happily share the information because I hate stupid managers. Stupid managers make it harder for good managers. Like if your manager's an idiot and he's taking whatever people are throwing out there, then he's messing up the curve for us. Yep. So whether it's, whether it's booking shows, dealing with the labels, whatever, like 360 deals worked in the industry because they broke one and then two and then three, but they broke, they started with people they knew they could break. They didn't come see me and Chris Lighty and us first. They knew they had to fight with us for the 360, right? That, they knew that was going to be a fight. So if we can make it an industry norm by getting the new lawyers, the new lawyers, the new artists, we'll trick them first. Then we'll start with the ones that aren't as bright or as experienced. It, so it's on us. If I'm going to teach the next generation of managers how not to get fooled with old tricks, because they, they run the same tricks. They just rebag them. It's, it's necessary to have conversations and communicate and, and um, you know, keep 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 the growth going. Like the NBA has grown because Magic and them listened to Bill Russell and them, and then Magic and them grew it. Then Jordan grew it. When LeBron and D Wade and them get in, they grow on top of what all of them have done. In the music industry, sometimes I don't feel like because the the um 
the format changes that have taken place, it's almost been at every format, we've almost had a reset. And at each reset point, they start the same bullshit. Yep. So that's kind of, so to the point of, I communicate because I don't think I own it. And I think that it can only help everybody if I'm willing to tell stories or share my troubles, whatever it is. I, I do, I feel like that in music, in life, mental health issues, whatever, by, by being willing to communicate, somebody's not going to feel alone out there and may, you may help them get over whatever hurdle they're dealing with. Yo, what do you say to somebody? Because again, I, I, can, I can go back to when I was struggling and, and, and dying to get in this music industry. And I just couldn't because the people I was working up under and interning up under, they felt threatened. They felt threatened with a guy who knew nothing. I was just hungry. I just wanted in. And they literally would, would, would be like this, hoarding information. If, you know, back in them days, it, it was faxes, or if they mm-hmm. wanted you to call, they was blocking the numbers. It was crazy stuff going on. <laughs> like, what, what, what do you say to somebody who right now is, is threatened by somebody coming up under them, not realizing that this person could be, could be a blessing in the future. I mean, the truth is you got to check, check your ego and your person and your insecurities. People, people, when you have a lot of insecurities, when you're not really confident that you should even be there or you're not confident in your ability, that's how you get threatened. If you're confident, I do what I do and can't nobody do what I do like I do, then you shouldn't feel threatened. I'll tell people all the time, I can tell you the formula. I'll, I'll tell you the map. That don't mean you can do what I do. I tell somebody, this is exactly what I did with OutKast. Go ahead. But you can't, so I'm not threatened, but I can't speak for, you know, we got a lot of, of um, people in this industry that this industry became their armor. It became their identity. It became who they are. And losing that space and losing that. And um, that's why when we get positions of power, that's why we don't have enough black executives. Because when we got positions of power, we usually put a white person in right next to us as the second in command. And then we didn't empower enough of our own people. So that's why we don't have enough black executives. Like white people had a lot to do with it, but the reason we don't have a lot of competent black executives is because of the black executives that we thought were competent at the time, not teaching. There you go. So if you didn't teach, don't stand on the outside now and go, damn, the industry, blah, blah. No, because when you were running it, you didn't empower nobody. Or when people started to come up around you, you would get scared and fire them. Or you like, we, we have been our own enemies in this industry. Um, and it's, it's going to come back to bite us sooner than later. No, I'm going to tell you something. I'm listening to you and, and I swear, um, you are echoing not just my sentiments, but words I have actually said out of my own mouth. You, you, I, I can remember talking to my staff and talking to my team. And I was so free with my contact information. I was so free with the way I did things. Yo, you go, you call this person. Just let them know you calling. You work with Sean Prez. You go, you do this. Because I knew a couple of things. Number one, if I empower somebody, they were going to work super hard for me. They were going to be out there as long as they can get in the club and they can, do, you know, get a phone call through mm-hmm. using my name. They were always going to work super hard. But I also knew if I could get 10 people that I put on, that means I'm in 10 places at once. Yeah. And all of these people, they know it was me. It was Prez who put me in position. And anything he need, I got him. So now I got an army out there all over the country who is happy to pick up a phone call for me or even somebody I can't get a call through for. Prez, hold up, I got him. It, and I never, ever felt threatened. I never felt threatened. And I know that has to come from my days of trying to get in and I watch people hold people down. 
you know, and I always thought it was the worst way to carry out business. I, I, I never thought that that was the way. Have, doing it the other way, it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to call it legacy, but it is legacy. So it is, and it's, it's proven. You put on is doing it. That means you still in the game. It's proven. I mean, the, it, the reality is, unfortunately, a lot of our friends, a lot of our uh, associates in this industry, they also mimic too, mimic too much drug game stuff. And then drug game is the same way. Crew can be okay, but somebody at the top is jealous or nervous, and somebody's coming for his slot and trying to hold little man down. Now you don't held him down so much that now he resents you, and now you have made another enemy. Music industry, we copy too much of that. In, in the long run, but I've studied the Rothschilds. I've studied others, and I and I've seen why some com- some families are still around and still have a, an amount of power that they wield, and some are gone. The Roth the Rothschilds' secret was their family bank that they created. Everybody got a life insurance policy. Everybody was connected to everybody's life and death, so everybody was in the business of building the Rothschild name brand family. Other families got their money, was blowing through it. Last generation died off. There was no legacy. It was nothing because every man was for himself and everybody was trying to get daddy's favor so they could get the most of the inheritance so they could blow through it. Like, I think that there's always going to be people that can see a bigger picture and a longer game. And there's always going to be people that just see the short game and what's in it for them and the, and the immediacy of it. And, and that's kind of what has always separated is even us as black people. Nah, you're absolutely right. You know something blue, what I did should have did at the top of this conversation? You mentioned Outcast. But mm-hmm. for anybody who's not familiar with your name and your background, just give them a quick rundown. This ain't showing off, but give them a quick rundown <laughs> of all of the artists that you manage. All the artists I manage? Is, is, um, I, mean, I know we can't oh. go through. I mean, let's go with the big ones, the, the, the Nick Cannons. I, I'll oh. let you tell it. So... I, I actually was, I'm working on a book on management. And so in doing it, I needed to put a list together. So one day on a plane, I just put a list of everybody I worked with. Um, and it wasn't really any particular order. It was just kind of, um, so my name is Michael Blue Williams, born and raised in the Bronx, New York. Um, I stumbled into this music industry in 1992 or 1991 um, with a group called Jodeci. Um, started as Jodeci's roadie. I was the bottom. I, I did everything. I went to Waffle House at two in the morning. I loaded, unloaded the bus. I just, it was a job. I just wanted to be out there and get the experience and kind of learn. Um, I went from Jodeci's roadie to Jodeci's bodyguard. Uh, went from Jodeci's bodyguard to Mary J. Blige's bodyguard, from Mary J. Blige to SWV, SWV to Shy. Um, just kind of kept growing as this bodyguard slash road manager. And in 1994, yeah, nine, in 1994, Shaquem Compare, who manages Queen Latifah, um, had gotten to know me from the road and playing ball at Hollywood Y and stuff like that. And he basically, um, I offered, I was going to help him get the group Shy for management. Shy was looking for new management. Um, and Shy was like, yo, if you get me the group, I'm basically going to give you a job. You can come work. So I got Shy and, and Shaquem to meet. Shy signed the flavor unit for management. Shaquem gave me a job. Um, as a manager, I'm thinking, oh, cool. I'm about to get shy and I'm going to start right here at the top and do what I got to do. Um, but Shaquem actually gave shy to this girl, Mandy, that had been working at Flavian, who had, he felt had more experience. And he gave me the Fushnickens and Nonchalant. And those were my first two artists that I managed. Um, and then over the next three, four years, I eventually became president of Flavian Unit. Um, then I left Flav Unit and started Family Tree. And so in the combination of being at Flav Unit and Family Tree, I have managed Outkast, Monica, Faith Evans, SWV, Donnell Jones, the Fushnickens, Nonchalant, Raphael Sadiq, Life Jennings, Case, Donnell Jones, Eric Rene, Big Sean, Cody Simpson, CeeLo Green, Casey and JoJo, Nas, Jagged Edge, Nick Cannon, Macy Gray, Youngbloods, Nicole Ray, Major, Molly Music, Genuine, TGT, Trina, Shanice, Keith Murray, Young Buck, Sunshine Anderson, Ro James, and Gina Thompson. 
Talk that talk, Blue. <laughs> talk that. That's a mic drop moment right there. Like, like that's a, damn. And that's and when I say man is for your behind. Yes, name on the back of the album, plaques to go with it. Yes, those are the managers. Like when it was management, when we had to sell records. But you know what's the best part of that story? Like real talk. I know. I know you have mentioned some of the most legendary artists uh, to ever touch a microphone. But the most, the best part of that story is, you 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 started out in one of the most humble places in the industry. You you was a roadie. You 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 were straight for anybody who don't know what a roadie is, a roadie <laughs> does the grunt work. You do all the stuff that nobody else, nobody else, else wants to do. to do. Everybody everybody's your boss when you're a roadie. The, the security tells you what to do, road manager tells you what to do, the, the principals tell you what to do. Shit, the bus driver might tell you what to do. Just because you out there, I'm I don't know who I'm supposed to listen to, so I'm listening to everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> And you just do it, man. Yeah. You, you get up. And nah, I, I think it's great because here's half of the problem. With and you know, I, I don't want I don't want to pile on. Everybody always talk about social media. Social media has a lot of positives, but it also has a lot of negative. A lot effects. of negatives, yeah. One of the greatest negative effects that social media have is that it shows people today. It shows where they are in this moment. It shows them in the big house. It shows them spending money. It shows them first class flights. It shows them at, 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 at the, the, the five star restaurants, five star hotels. What it doesn't show is the grind. It don't show the hustle. It don't show the setbacks. It don't show, yo, I'm ready to throw my hands up because I've been trying everything that I can and I just can't get nothing to click. So it shows a person like yourself not realizing I've been doing this since 92. Like, like, like that's, that's a legitimate 30 years of grind. Do you have that in you? Do you have the commitment to, to say, I want to do something and stick with it for 30 years. And most people can't do, do you have what it takes to stick with it for five years <laughs> till you get a break? Good for you, man. Good for you. Thank um, you, man. I, I, I got to ask you, uh, who's the most difficult artist to work with? Any Gemini. <laughs> That's why <what I'm> <laughs> any, any Gemini artist is going to be the most difficult. I mean, the difficulties that you get from artists are different based on this, the different factors and different where you are, where the stage is in their career. But Gemini's in general, Macy Gray, CeeLo Green, Andre 3000. Um, those, those are, they're special, they're special talents. I'm telling you, the talent is there, but the artsy, the artistic side of them can make dealing a, a little more difficult than others. So I, I would honestly, I, w I wouldn't, I wouldn't specify one, though they've all been a pain in my ass at some point, but so I honestly would just group all the Gemini artists who, again, if I go through them on the list, they are the most talented also. But, man, it, it, it's not a cakewalk. <laughs> okay. Give me an idea. Like, like you just named Macy Gray, CeeLo Green, uh, Andre 3000, who are, come on, these are arguably some of the biggest talents in, in, in the yeah. history of music. Uh, yeah. When, when, when you say difficult, what are we talking? Uh, you have. Let me to put it in perspective. The... I'll put it in Say perspective for you. I, I'll put it in perspective. I'm going to name some other artists that are Gemini's, and then you're going to kind of see the link. Mm -hmm. Lauren Hill, D'Angelo, Maxwell, um, who else in there? Pac, I think was in there. Um, it's just the list of them. So what I like to say, D'Angelo, I said Maxwell, what I like to say about Gemini's artistically, they're amazing, but they're also, they can be very precise and they can, they get into their creatives can be like their personalities. And if they got six personalities, then you got six personalities trying to get their thoughts and ideas into that creative box. And usually they can create magic, but sometimes 
it can also become paralyzing. They, it's safe, that's why it takes so long to get some of these albums from these artists because they get in their own way. They're going to keep their question and the devil take. I might still be waiting for Dre to finish mixing Hey Ya today if I hadn't taken it from him when we like and got it and got it to LA and got it out. That's what just because we want like the 12th we call. Those that don't know, it's like you, you get a record, you do it, you mix it. Then the artist goes to listen to the mix and they hear something. There's a snare missing or something. So they do a recall and they have you raise the snare. Then they send it back. They get it back. Now they raise the snare and it took out the flute. So now they can't hear the flute. So now they want to go and they want to put the flute back in and they do the flute. They got to lower the drums a little. So they send it back in. Now your third recall, the drums feel too soft. So now your drums are off because the flute's too loud and the snare, like, and that is what they will get into a cycle of doing. But the record was fine at the beginning. Couldn't nobody hear that chime or that flute but them. But they're perfectionists like that. So from a creative standpoint, you have to manage that because we can't go in and play the label a record and the label's like, press the button. The whole world's going to be behind this. We're setting release dates. Everybody go, go, go. And they're like, all right, so we need you to turn that record in in three days. And you're like, all right, got you, cool. And then you go to your client. He's like, yo, I'm doing one more recall tonight. Now, three weeks later, he's still doing recalls. Everyone's freaking out because they're, they're like, yo, we said we were going to go. The whole world is waiting. And this person's tweaking some sounds that you can't tell the difference from recall number three to recall number 13. So that's the Gemini life that you can live. You know, super creative, very intelligent, quirky in each of their own different ways, but kind of harder to manage than most. Uh-oh. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, even as you was talking, um, I was thinking of a few Gemini artists that I work with over the years, and I, I think you might really have something with that. I never looked at it in terms of the uh, of their astrological signs, but you you might be on to something right there. Man, look, any any manager that's managed or executives that have dealt with a lot of artists over the years, they're gonna tell you if they if they've ever put it together, they're gonna be like, it's the Gemini thing. Damn. You know something? You you talked about, and I want to go backwards for a second because there's so much history in you. Uh, I want to get as much out of this conversation as humanly possible. You said the first artist that you uh, managed, and I think at that time you were still working with, with Shaq Kim and, and Queen mm-hmm. Latifah, uh, mm-hmm. Nonchalant and Fushnikis. Yes. What was, were, were, you know, I don't think people give Shaquille O'Neal the credit he deserved. Uh, mm. Gosh, move, we ain't got nothing to prove. Nothing Who's to prove, what? Right? was doing yeah. their thing back in the days. Yes. Right alongside of Daz Effects. They, they, and that, yeah. that was the golden age. Of Four Christ. Righteous Teachers. Yep. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, which, did, did you have hands-on uh, management or, or any hands-on with, with Shaq when he was down with uh, Shaq Fu? So Shaq was moving. So I came in and Shaq was already Shaq. So, and I, and so before that, I was already cool with Shaq because me and Dennis Scott were friends from my Jodeci days and stuff. So when Shaq got drafted, he was in Orlando and all that, we kind of, that's where we first kind of met. And then I ended up at Flav Unit and Shaq was taking the food sneakers with him every place. So in that instance, he was opening up a lot of doors for the guys by letting them roll with him. Then Jive gave him his solo deal. And that's when they dropped the Shaq Fu video game and his project. And so that was kind of the end of Shaq and the Fu Snickers. But yeah, I got a chance to make some of those, get some of those Shaq experiences, All-Star Weekend in Utah, Shaq took us all those type of things. Got a chance to experience some really cool, you know. It's funny because what I always tell people is I remember even back then, Shaq was saying like, yo, I'm never going to cash any of my NBA checks. And we was going, what? what are you talking? And he was like, yo, the endorsements, I'm going to live off my endorsement deal and stuff like that. And so to see this time later, having watched his whole career and everything, and know that Shaq is still getting his endorsement money and still eating great off of just endorsements, I, 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 whenever I see him, I always tell him I respect that. He stuck with the plan. He didn't get pulled off the course. Yo, it's so crazy that you say that, um, you know, because it just shows the business mind of some of these people from very, very early on. Um, 
Mm-hmm. For Shaq to be a young, I mean, let's let's just call it what it is. He was top of the world. This guy's seven feet yeah. two inches tall. Um, Twism. The world is mine. Remember exactly. that was his joint. Yep, Twism. The, the world mm-hmm. is mine. This dude was was top of the charts. He came on the on the on the hip hop side. Actually, got a deal. Job gave him a deal and sold a gold album. Like, yeah, Shaq was the real deal. And yeah. So, to 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 hear that Shaq had the mindset back then, yo, I'm not cashing no NBA checks. That's insane. Mm-hmm. That that's insane no. because most people, especially that young, they got to burn through a few few mil before their <laughs> eyes open up. They got to yes. damn near be be bankrupt oh, before yeah. they say, yo, you know what? Damn, I did it all wrong. I ball till I fall, but I got nothing to show for it. I got to yeah. get back to work. That's amazing that he said that. You know the only other person I heard, heard, ever heard say that? Funk Flex. Flex, okay. you know, from years ago was like, yo, I don't cash none of my, of my Hot 97 checks. He was like, I never did. Which is crazy, mm-hmm. and that and that dude been working at, at on He's radio for thirty five years. Been <laughs> yeah, <Yep>. yeah. <laughs> oh I man, went okay. to him. Um, now I was thinking, Flex went to. So he's from the Bronx. I'm from the Bronx. So he went to I'll Save You Lutheran, and I went to Fordham Prep. So you know, yeah, that's yeah, well over thirty years. <laughs> Yo, it's crazy because I'm from the Bronx too. Oh. Uh, I, I went to golf and Sam golf is up in the BX. Yeah, yeah. Nah, I went uh, Chris Brooks. So I went to Kennedy too. Of course. Too. Chris Brooks and, so, and Chris Light. Chris Brooks. Yes, went to golf. I remember the first time, <laughs> it's totally off to this one. But So I'm one of the few people that actually played ball and was in the industry. Not an industry person that kind of played basketball. I was a basketball player that ended up in the industry. Like I was in college for basketball. So And when I came home, when everybody else was Hamptons and all that shit, I was down on 55th, West 4th. Buckley and old place. And I'll never forget the first time I went up against Chris before he went to West Virginia. It's still high school. And and all you knew is that they was calling him the monkey Jesus. <laughs> and because yep. he could jump and he was just so strong. And so little 150 pound me trying to guard Chris and he jumps up and he taps his, the ball on the back of his neck. Now we in high school and I'm eager and I'm like, I'm stopping this. I jump up and try and rub it. He takes me and the ball to the rim, <laughs> drops the ball off and me <laughs> right on the floor at Gompers. The school goes crazy. I was like, what just happened? Oh, like, he, I he never did it had... at Gompers? It was at Gompers. We went at Gompers. Remember, you used to play a home and home with everybody. Yes, yes. So it was at Gompers. And you know that gym lost its mind. I couldn't get out. I couldn't get out of the building fast enough. I think. <laughs> I don't know. I say, I'm like, I think some of that madness and playing high school ball and the way we used to scream on people and things that happened made me, always made me feel comfortable on the stage, even if I was on stage doing stuff, not performing, but just being in front of. As I tell people, when you're in the industry, just because you're not on stage singing, there's so many other jobs to do that you can be on stage in front of 18,000 people every night too, because you might just be someone's security. So you're standing on stage. There's still that audience is looking up and they're looking at you. You're background singer. You're, you're playing. You're, you're still going to be in front of a lot of people. And when people be like, I'm shy, I don't like to be in front of people, this ain't the business for you because you're going to be in front of people if you are on the out in that space. So I, I actually probably owe Chris Brooks some thanks to some of my success. Like, yeah, R.I.P. Chris Brooks. I mean, that guy was, was Charles Barkley, like yes. literally in high school. Yes. This is strong as hell, but you know, yeah, yeah, that Gompers. dude was beyond strong. Yeah, he was definitely all right, Pete. But sorry, got off the music side to my basketball. It's crazy. I, I I had no idea you was you was playing ball in in our gym. Like that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. Basketball took me okay. a lot of places. Uh, got a question for you. Mm-hmm. You started out a flavor unit. What made mm-hmm. you branch out from flavor unit and start Family Tree? So I started Family Tree while I was at Flavor Unit because. Shaquem was giving me a piece of commission off of each artist I managed. So instead of me getting taxed, that's when I first kind of really learned I needed to create LLC. So I created Family Tree as my LLC. Um, but what eventually led to me leaving, what got me to come to Flavian was Shaquem told me, you're never going to get rich working for other people. 
he was when he was talking to me about it, he was meant you're never going to get rich being out here on the road for these people. You're just going to keep getting salaries and stuff like that. But if you come work for me, you can get a salary and commission. That's how you, you get, you'll get rich. So that's why I went. I was like, oh, okay. And I was good. I was $3,500 a week. When, by the time I, Shaquem and them came down, I was $400 a week when I started with Jodeci. By the time Shaquem and them came down me, I was $3,500 a week for me to be out on the road with you and doing security road management, whatever. And that was great money for me at the time. I ain't yeah. no, like, I'm 24. Like, I'm every place. We living a good life. So when he said that, it made sense. So that's why I went to work for Flavor Green. Three years later, when it was time for, when, when we started getting really big and a lot was going on, we kind of disagreed what that 5% was. As the checks got bigger, as we got hotter, um, <laughs> there was some, the negotiations on how much 5% looked different too. Like my 5% didn't look big when it was $1,500 out of a $5,000 check and stuff like that. But when it was $50,000 out of a, a check, it was like, oh, well, I meant five. It was just, you you outgrow a company where I'm never going to get rich working for someone else, which means I'm never going to get rich working for you and Dana. This is Fla- this is Flavian. This is you and Dana's company. So no matter how much I bring in with the nine artists that I'm managing over here, you guys still going to take the bulk of that check. So it just made sense that it was time for me to go do the work and me get a bulk of the check. And Amicable had a conversation with Shaq Kim. Cool. It was, there was no fighting. There was nothing. Let me take, he let me take Outkast. Um, I think I took Outkast, like Donnell Jones, like a couple artists that I had been doing anyway um, and broke out. Okay. You just told me something I didn't know. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize Outkast was originally signed to to Flavor Unit. Yes, that was. So the story goes, 1994, Queen Latifah Dana runs into Dallas Austin. Dallas Austin gives her a tape on Monica Arnold. Dana falls in love with Monica, thinks she's the greatest thing, tells me and Shaquem to go get Monica for management. We fly to Atlanta to meet with Monica, her parents, Dallas, the whole nine. We get Monica, wrap that up. Before we leave, Shaquem's like, yo, let's go by the face, say what's up to LA and them. Just like kind of, we in your town, courteous, the whole thing. We go, LA is telling us about a group that he has called Outcast, that he had put a record on his Christmas album and it was starting to go. Um, and it was funny. Shaquem wanted to get in business with L.A., who seemed to have this, all this talent in the South that was going. And L.A. wanted to get business with, in business with Shaquem because he had a group like Outkast, and he'd seen what Shaquem had done in hip-hop with Naughty by Nature and that. So the original relationship was formed between Shaquem and L.A. I got handed to do the work. And so I was like, cool. I don't think... To be honest, looking back, either of them ever really understood what it could have been. Really, at the end of the day, it was a relationship builder for the two of them. And it wasn't like either of them were really like, this is going to become what Outcast became. That was on me. So I took on Outcast because Shaquem and Chris Lighty were my idols. And they had Tribe Called Quest and they had Naughty by Nature. So I... Outcast was going to be my chance to, like, from the beginning, like, I came in on the Foo Snickers. Mm-hmm. So I, I inherited and was working the Foo Snickers differently than Outcast, who I got in and was able to, and like, it was my group. There was no things about it, and I was able to rock and roll. So, yeah, we started with Flavor Unit. I, on one trip to Atlanta, I got Monica and Outcast for management, and that's kind of where the rise began. Okay. And, and I definitely didn't know that backstory, so thanks for sharing it. Mm-hmm. In terms of management, uh, do you ever walk away from artists? Do you ever say, yo, it's just no chemistry here? Or is for you, whether it's chemistry, it's no chemistry, this is a job, I do my job, and that's that? No, I, I think that management is, is too difficult if it's, there's no chemistry. For me, it's too difficult if there's no chemistry and stuff Management, I tell people, like boxing. Styles make fights. You know, um, some artists 
Y'all styles are going to gel. It's going to work. Y'all going to have a chemistry. It's going to go. You go seven, eight albums like me and Outcast. Y'all worked together for 13 years. You're Dana and Latifah. Y'all been together 30 years. Like Shaka and Luda and Jeff been together. Some, sometimes y'all hit and y'all just go. Sometimes you work with an artist just for a cycle. And a cycle is one album period, if you like to think of it. It's like they hire you, you drop the album, you do some touring. And if it doesn't do what they thought it was going to do, they blame you, you get fired. Some artists have had eight or nine managers because it's never their fault. And they're always switching managers. And if you know, you know. For me, because of Flavio, I was able to come into management from a position where I never had to make decisions based off of needing money. And and I, I and every manager should be like that because what happens is if I'm managing you and I'm on my own and I need to pay my bills, I might take a show so we can get some money in. That may not be the best show. My decision is being influenced by the bills I need to pay. But when you got at least a base salary and your bills are getting paid, then you can go, I'm not going to take this one unless they come back and I'm a hold for this number because I need to up my group's number. Or I need to be on this stage instead of that stage because it's a better look. Now you're making decisions that are pure, purely intelligent management decisions. You're not making decisions because you have to pay bills. And what I've done in, in most of my career is I haven't had to be in that position. And in times when I've, had, I've been in that position where I find myself making decisions, I don't like doing it. It's just not me. It's not, to me, I'm a purist when it comes to management. So that's not pure management. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just how, that's my chip on my show. Like, I want to make the best decision for my artist, even if it means me not getting in this half million dollar check before Christmas or before Thanksgiving so I can, me and my family and everybody can have a great Christmas. But nah, we ain't budging off this number we say we need. And if that means we got to start again on January 16th, then it'll just be a slow fucking Christmas. That's how I'm built. Everybody's not built like that. Different managers, look, I'm getting get my check in for this nigga change his mind. And I got stuff I need to do for Christmas. Everybody's different. I'm not saying that I'm any better or any worse. But for my, the way I've always managed, it's been about being able to make the best decisions for the artist. Also, being able to look at myself and be totally, totally honest about what I believe the talent can and cannot do. I think you have to be very realistic about what you believe the heights of that talent can go. And can you get it there? Some artists you meet, that's just going to be a gold artist. Gold, you can eat, you can feed your families, and if he's not a pain in the neck and he's going to do the work, some gold artists have been the best artists to work because they're not difficult. They know their role, they stay in their lane, they do what they got to do. Some artists have had three or four managers and have acquired a bunch of bad habits and think they can talk to you any old way or think they can pay you when they want to pay you and think they just going to wild out. And then you have to go, hold up, hold, hold up. Wait, first and foremost, I'm a grown ass man. Like we're going we gonna to start with respect or we're going to stop right here. And I think that never letting my integrity be for sale, never ever feeling like any one artist is more important than I am in the equation has allowed me to move the way I wanted to move. It's not ego. It's just like some people say, if you've done it, do it again. Show me. I've done it over and over and over again. When I say I've managed artists, I'm saying I managed the artists that you grew to like. I'm not, some of my managed, you already knew they were, but most of them, I'm the reason why you got to like grow and like them. So I know I'm not somebody that could only manage one artist. I know I can manage five or six artists at one time. I can take one artist from the bottom to the top. Like, so it allows me to speak with a certain confidence and a truthfulness to myself. It doesn't make any sense if you think that you could be the greatest artist of all time. And I think you could be the greatest artist of all time. But the reality is you're not really that great. So now we're about to spend a bunch of time beating our heads against the wall instead of one of us being realistic and going, he could be a really good, like, this artist. So let me maximize his talent in this lane. Anthony Hamilton, for all his talent, is never going to be Bruno Mars. Correct. So for Anthony Hamilton to maybe go in tomorrow and start trying to make a bunch of Bruno Mars-type records and stuff wouldn't benefit Anthony. 
Not to say Alan Anthony isn't the most talented or as talented as Bruno Mars. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's differences that are out of either of their controls that give one an advantage and other not. You know what I'm saying? Like just the reality. Anthony's team needs to know how to maximize who Anthony is and, and what he can do and make the most out of that money and career and talent. Same way Bruno's people are doing for him. And I think good management has to always be able to look at their artists and be realistic with who their artist is, who the, what the artist is capable of really doing, and then really assessing, can I get it there? Because there's also no problem with needing help. If your experiences can only get you through here and you're not sure that how to wiggle something, sometimes you can do a co-manage. Give up a piece of your pie to make your pie bigger. You ain't got to give your artist away. Just make the pie bigger. And, and sometimes for certain artists, that's worked. Nobody's known that there was a co-manager. Irving Azoff does it all the time. Somebody calls him, needs some help. Irving puts his arm kind of around him, helps them navigate, makes the artist bigger, takes a piece. That manager still looks like the star. So it's kind of, you got to figure out the style of the artist you're managing and as a manager, adjust your game to it and never forget that you work for the artist. Listen, at the end of the day, no matter, at the end of the day, I always work for Alphys. I've always worked for him. I'm, I'm basically an employee. People look to you like you're the boss. I'm, I'm the boss of their business, but I'm technically not their boss. And if you understand that, and you also are able to keep in mind that it's a business relationship as much as it's a friendship. Look, when you're a good manager and you're a manager with your artist for six, seven years, you know who the family, you learn the kids, the baby mamas, the girlfriends, the best friends, the cousins, everybody. But one day they're gonna fire you. And that friendship is gonna be, you know, tested. <laughs> and you're gonna have to figure out, you know, where do you go after that? I've had artists that fired me three times because they've come back three times. And now we in one of those in-betweens where I'm not fired, but I'm not hired, but they call me for stuff. Like relationships are gonna, with age, you're gonna grow and you're gonna change and you should mature and you should be able to navigate um, the changing in the relationships that you have with people. You know, you, you clearly carry yourself with a ton of integrity. You clearly understand uh, the value that you bring as a human being to the job, which is management. But how difficult is it? Because every artist out there, they feel as though they should be as big, if not bigger, than their peers. They see somebody else doing something, playing a certain stage, playing a certain venue. They want to know why am I not there? So yeah. how do you get an artist to trust you, to trust I am making the best decisions that is going to catapult your career to the next level, even if you can't see it now, or even if I have to turn down a few dollars so that we can make more in the months to come? So I think trust, trust is earned. So I start off with trust, but you, you earn trust. And I tell young managers that say, like, mean what you say, do what you say, like, especially early on, because that's how you earn trust. If you tell somebody you're going to do this, then you do it. And, and artists will learn to trust you when they start seeing things get done or if they ask you something and your response is this, or like you build trust and equity by being good and being thorough. And the artist is like, well, why can't we do this? And you go, well, we can't do this yet because of this. And they go, well, such and such is doing that. And then you go and you look and see why that person is doing that. And you go back to them and you go, this is why he's doing that. Are you willing to do that? If you're willing to do that, then we can get there. But what you better do is when you get them to do that, you better be able to get them like you said you could get them there. When you do that, you gain the trust. When you say, I'm going to go get the label to get me another 50000 for us to shoot this video, when you don't get that 50000 you lost an opportunity to gain the trust. But when you come back with 75000 your trust went up. So you earn an artist's trust over time, honestly, by delivering doing what you say you're going to do and delivering and they learn to trust you. And when you're wrong, say I was wrong. It's not the end of the world. I tell artists all the time, 
don't take the job so personal. I, I feel like 90% of the time, any idea that I throw into my artists, they're going to reject because it's coming from me. They will find a way to circle back and act like either they had the idea or somebody <laughs> told them an idea or <laughs> they read it on a fucking fortune cookie, whatever the hell, anything to avoid just admitting that it was my idea. So now, am I going to stand on it was my idea? And no, oh, fine. Greg Street did it. All right, it was Greg Street's idea. Fine. I just need to get shit done. That's my approach. Yo, I would tell you, you got to go into this job selfless. You really do. If you, yeah. if you take yourself too serious, management is not for you. It's going to kill you. It's nah, kill management you. will absolutely kill you. know something? You managed you manage Outcast for 13 years. Mm-hmm. What was that breakup like? Painful. Hard. It was, um... I mean, I gotta believe these were your friends. I know y'all did mm-hmm. business Little together. Brothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these are your brothers at this point. Mm-hmm. So, so, was... so... Did, did they walk away from you? Did they fire you? Did you walk away from them? What, what did that look like? I, I'd like to say we all walked away from each other. I think that... So here's the thing about Outcast. We put out six studio albums. And then two, like, the greatest hits and some and the soundtrack. Go back and check your greatest rap groups that you've seen. Three, tops, maybe four. You don't, you don't get to, like, rap groups don't stay together like that to get to six, seven, eight albums. In doing that, in keeping yourselves together, and in, 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 in do, there's sacrifices that come with being in a group, whether it's a rap duo or a four-piece band. That's why they don't last long, because everybody, some people get tired of their sacrifices. Big and Dre had been doing this since they were 17, 18. There have been a lot of compromises. Big is one way, Dre is another way. There was a lot of tugging and pulling. And I spent 12 years of their lives tugging, pulling, pushing, slapping, like just whatever I needed to do to get across the next finish line. And I think it was kind of like, as we finished up Idlewild and everything, it was kind of like burnout and just kind of, it was kind of like, so technically me getting fired was the first straw to fall technically, but it ended up being a walk away time for everybody to take a break. So Outcast never broke up. Big and Dre still talk. They're just not making music together as Outcast right now. And that was very important to me because I've studied the game and I realized that when you break up or you announce a breakup, your fans lose interest. They lose hope. They're over it. If you're fed up with it, they're fed up. But so long as you're still kind of together and there's a chance, there's a smidgen of hope that you guys might get back again and do an album. You might look up and be 15 years later and people are still like, when are y'all doing a new album? Because you never broke up. And that's kind of where Outcast is now. People want, just want a new Outcast album. They're not mad at either guy, but they want a new Outcast album. That was you me. Know, it's, it's interesting because clearly Big is still out there. He's working. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dre, I mean, this is a guy who, you know, he's he's been to Hollywood. He's done movies. You know, they they it was recent that um it it was just stamped that they had the biggest selling rap album of all time mm-hmm. right love below I mean, speaker box 13 million correct i mean these mm-hmm. these these guys are mainstream they're rock stars but i i literally just saw an instagram the other day with andre in japan i think playing a flute <laughs> like <laughs> Is this so, it's like like real talk? Like you you have the, these dudes. It, it, they're as big as they come. Like th- this is this is rock and roll big. You don't mm-hmm. sell thirteen million records, and you're unknown. Mm-hmm. Y- you can't go no place on the planet, and anywhere you go on the planet, the red carpet is rolled out for you. Mm-hmm. Did, did you ever see it coming? where Dre was just going to throw his hands up to the industry and just be like, yo, I just want to go do me. I mean, he's been spotted in Seattle. 
He's been spotted in Japan. Like I said, I just saw the man with it looked like a a, a, a flute. A, yeah, it looked like a flute. He was playing with with a, a turban on his head. It's a flute. Yeah. Um. Again, Gemini, free free thinker, free spirit. Um. A lot of artists just want to get famous and rich so they can be hot on their block. They want to be hot around the neighborhood. They want to be hot in their family. They just want to be hot. Some artistic people see the art as a path to freedom, to be able to travel the world, learn things, experience new things, um, embrace different culture, um, not be a prisoner of the nine to five or whatever cycle that people get caught up into. Dre's that type. Dre's just enjoying his life. He's just, music isn't his sole driver. And Jimmy Ivey told me this a long time ago. He said, Bruce Springsteen is, is like this. And, and as I, I've always read, there's some artists that like that. When money isn't their driver, it's hard to find the motivation for them. Like, you have to figure out what excites them. What's going to get them motivated to do what they, what they do so well? Which to all of us, if we could do what they do, we would be doing it, killing it, doing it all the time. But they're bored with it. But they're over it. It doesn't keep their attention anymore. But they're so good that the world wants them to do it. But they don't want to do it just because the whole world wants them to do it. And so they search. They travel. They, they, they try new things. They find things they like. It's, it's so rare that we see a black person do it. We just don't, it's like this, this oddity to us to see Dre doing it. But really, he's just kind of living his life, enjoying his life, not bothering nobody. And just right now, not interested in, in doing Outcast raps. You know, you hope that he comes back. So when Outcast first, when you said it was difficult, here's the thing. It was completely difficult. I felt it was, the, I dealt with depression. I was getting high. I was doing everything I was to try and figure out because in my mind, I'm trying to figure out what I did wrong. How could I have prevented this? What could I have done differently? And eventually you have to come to realization. There's nothing that you could, just things maybe along the way you could have done a step differently. Or, or that, and, and that's you thinking that that would have done it. No proof that that would have done it, but you're thinking it would have stopped the process. But the reality is eventually you have to come to the realization that he's a grown man making his own decision. And are you going to respect his decision or are you going to be angry about the decision he made? I had to reconcile not being angry because I was very angry for a long time. I lost $25 million in one year because of his decision. I had to make a decision to get over that anger. And that required me to talk to him a couple of times and let him know how angry I was. It just required me as a man to learn how to deal with emotions that nobody I know has ever dealt with. It's not, I don't know many black men that have lost $25 million and they did everything right. Like, not ego wise, but I did everything I was supposed to do without care. I turned them into the biggest rock group in the world. The payout was us going on tour and stuff. And when Dre decided not to do it, he didn't want to go on tour. So we lost a tremendous amount of money on touring opportunities and stuff like that. So I had to learn, as Big Boy did, how to respect our brother and his choices and our friend while reconciling what we were losing in, in, in what we had all worked to build. And so, yes, it was difficult. Um, yes, it's something that will haunt you for a long time. <laughs> um, but you also, I like to find similar um, stories of paths in life. When I'm dealing with something, I, it helps me to maybe find someone that's been through something similar to give me a, a route to see what the other side can look like and that I can get to the other side. So Irving Azoff, who I mentioned before, who's a legend in the game, um, has managed everybody, built Live Nation up. This is, this is the real, the king of this, this manager shit, right? Um, he managed the Eagles in the 70s when the Eagles were the biggest band. The Eagles, the same thing happened. The lead singer of the Eagles walked away. Eagles broke up while they were at the top of the world. Left Irving like, what? What do I do? This is like 1974, right? 
Irving had to gather himself up, lift himself up, and figure out how to proceed. He went on to become president of, like, Capitol Records, a giant or whatever like that, started management stuff back up. He survived. What he never did was he never went at the Eagles. He never attacked them. He never did nothing. He chilled. 30 years later, 25 years later, the Eagles decide they want to get back together. They call Irving. Now Irving's this super powerful guy at La Nation. And over his last 25 years, he's learned all the tricks and levers. So when the Eagles get back together, he now knows how to make them the biggest touring legendary artists in the world. And the Eagles start making $50 million a summer for the last 10 years they've been making that. Recently, a member died. Irving's getting older. They're all in their 70s now. But through their 60s, all he did was print money with the Eagles. So in my mind, I've always been like, there may come a time, there's hope. Dre may call up one day and be like, yeah, you know what? I feel like doing it, folks. And to me, my job is to know where the $25 million, $50 million a, a summer checks are when he calls and when they're ready. So part of my brain is always kind of trying to figure out if I got to call tomorrow, what would it look like? Which is probably not healthy, but the therapist will probably say you're holding on to stuff, but that's the, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's the that's the method I watched somebody else do and they had a successful career. And you know, I also am at a stage where I don't enjoy management as much. Um it's not the same game that I grew up in, as you know. This isn't the same business that we started. We're not it's not the same it's a it's a popularity contest right now. It's not a talent show. You and I got in the business, it was the most talented wins. Or the most talented oh. gave you the best chance to win. This ain't got shit to do with talent. This is popularity. Can I manipulate algorithms and can I say the most ridiculous shit in the world so I get the looks and the views and the views translates into likes and the likes translate to labels? That ain't me. So my love for management has changed in my current form. So it's kind of different now to me when I look at certain things and when I look at the management game and the music industry and everything, it's kind of, it's lost some of that, that glow. And for people like yourself, I'm sure as well, those of us that legitimately right. were in it, it's changed. You, yeah. you know, uh, I got a couple of questions because you dropped so much right there. I, I should have asked you this earlier and, I, and I'm trying to have this conversation, but I'm also thinking about somebody looking on the outside that, that's trying to learn. Um, a, a season manager, what percentage are they getting versus a new entry-level manager? So management, beginner, vet, 20% is the standard. You take 20% of the gross income. Bigger managers will do... Like if you have a manager and you go to a big manager so that you can keep your manager because you love your manager, but he needs some help. Sometimes you can get a bigger manager to do a 10, 10 split with you. Um, some managers as they're with their artists a long time and you make a lot of money, they go down from 20% to say 15 to 10. Like, Oh, we've been doing this a decade together. We'd have made a shitload of money. And you know, I'm not having to do the same work I did in year one and three. So I'll drop my commission down to 12% or 10%. So it's it's a very variable thing, the management game. Um, sometimes you have to adjust your management commission whether you want to or not. Sometimes you get an artist on the road, you told them they were going to make a million dollars, they spent more money than they spent, and when it's all said and done, they're getting 300000 Well, if your commission check is also 300000 and they only make it 300000 and you take that 300000 <laughs> you, you you're going to have some problems. So sometimes it's smarter to take a step back and go, you know what? You should have made a half million on this tour or whatever. So I'm going to take 150 and I'm going to give you, like, we're going to give you 150 because you were out there doing the best show you could, blah, blah, blah. And then you make the business manager take all five. And you get everybody to take a hit so that artist feels better about themselves for the tour. That's not in any management book. That's not in anything you learn. That's you, that's a feeling and, and, and something that, you know, smart managers know. That's how you keep your artists happy. I've seen managers not budge. I, I can leave I can give an example of a manager of like the Backstreet Boys or one of them. 
they did this big world tour. But on the tour, they were balling. Everyone had their own bus. Then they'd be leaving their buses, taking private planes. Then they were wrecking suites. So what was the tour when they came home? Let's say they made 20 million gross. By the time everything was done, each member might have only been taking home a million. But since it was a $20 million tour, the manager technically should have made four million. You can't take four and the group only takes four because you're like, well, the group took four, I took my four. No, your members took a million each. So they looking at you crazy when you take that four. Now people want to audit what your numbers look like. It's just, you know what I'm saying? You got to be smart. You got to have some sense of, of your personnel. But that's gotcha. just management. If somebody was looking in, my, the reason I brought that up is you have to be flexible based on the situation sometimes. And your goal can't just be to get your 20%, that's it. Sometimes your 20% is gonna be 10% because your artist is spending more and you just gotta teach them how not to spend or you gotta teach, you gotta, you know, it's it's about educating artists as well. The smarter your artist is, usually the better your relationship is gonna go because when they understand their space in the game and in the world, then it's easier for you to, you as a team to work to getting to different levels. You can you can figure out. Latif is a perfect example. I, I I love the Shaquem and Latif relationship. I love how, for thirty years they've had each other's back, and if one is in the room, it might as well be the both of them in the room, and they they know how to to play off each other. They know when they're on the same page. If Dana's in the room with the president of Univision, then Dana's going to bring up Flavian and TV, and then she's going to trust that Shaquem got something in the can for them to give to Flavian and TV to give to Univision. That's how they work. And that's why they that's why Danny's got the number one show in the world right now with the equalizer. Because yep. somewhere in there they got in rooms and they worked that. So I think that you have to know your, your your partners and you have to, if you can, educate them. Some people don't want to be educated. There are a lot of artists that just want to rap, get hoes, drink liquor, get high, remix. You gotta know who that artist is. And if that artist isn't willing to do more, then you can't sit around and be like, oh, I'm about to make this dude Drake. Because Drake works. Drake puts it in work. He enjoys himself, but he works. Oh, I'm going to make this person Jay-Z. Are you? Because Jay works. And Jay maintains a certain amount of excellence. So, so I, that's why I go back to you got to be honest about who your client is. Yeah. Not who they say they want to be, not who they say they are. But you need to be able to say, that's who my client really is. And manage that person. You know, uh, I know you started out as a roadie. I believe you did road management. How much yes. does road managers work for me? Oh, who? In today's because game, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, getting a percentage. No, road managers don't get a percentage. A road manager, thousand, fifteen hundred a week, depending if the artist can afford that. But a small road manager might be five hundred a week. If you're a small artist and you're only making X amount. It kind of fluctuates on the on the road manager's experience, the budget or the size of the artist that he's working with. Um, those two factors will kind of affect where you are. Like, be honest, the only reason I got a thirty five hundred dollars a month is because I found out somebody else that I knew was doing it and he wasn't nowhere as good as me. So the next person that offered me a job, I was like, I need thirty five hundred a month. And they was like, Okay. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> and I took the thirty five hundred a month. <laughs> so <laughs> that was it. At the time, I was like, "Damn, maybe I should ask for five. That's real talk. You, you know, you work with so many different artists, and um, you you just said something that um, I think all artists and all managers need to listen to. Everybody want to be Drake, but not everybody's even capable or willing of doing the work that Drake, Jay Z. Kanye, Beyonce, Beyonce uh -huh. Taylor Swift, all, all of these mega stars have done. W what are some of the common traits that you see in artists that just go to the moment? Artists that, that you know, because it can't just be talent. It's got to be something else there that makes these artists bigger than all of their peers but more important, have that longevity. So honestly, I think 
there are a couple of different things that some artists do. First, you got to you have to be able to define what type of artist you're dealing with. I learned this a long time ago. You have entertainers, and then you have like you have singers or talent, a different type of talent. Like so, you have singers who just because they're natural raw talent can get on a stage every night and sing, and people will pay to hear them sing. They're not great performers. There's nothing next, but their vocals and the sound of their voice and what they sing about it makes them valuable and talented. They can tour whenever. Then you have entertainers who the singing is just okay, but their performances, they're going to give you everything else. Like their performance is going to be top notch. Their wardrobe is going to be right. or They're going to be on top of like, like making sure that you get the experience and that you love them from that. And they're so good at that. You might overlook that. They're not the best vocalist or whatever. And then you have stars. Stars are a different breed. The easiest measurement that I've ever that I've followed, and I learned it from L.A. Reid. This is like early too in my career. I learned it, and I've been following this now for almost 30 years. A star changes the energy when they enter a room. No difference or much about it. When a star enters the room, even maybe even before they're a star, when they enter the room, you know they've entered the room. Perfect example, the dream walks in the room tomorrow, anywhere in the world. No one's going to know. No disrespect to dream. One of the most talented writers, great talent, can sing the whole nine, but he's not a star. Chris Brown can walk in the room tomorrow and you can feel the star energy. You can feel, Nick Cannon comes in the room, you can feel the star energy. Stars change the energy of a room. What I had with Outkast, which was great, was that Big Boy and Dre are stars. Their stars shine differently, but they're both stars. That's what helped them as a group. But some artists are just stars on their own. And that's and people love to be around stars. People want to work with stars. They wanna they wanna be in awe of stars. And when you're a manager, when you have a star, you gotta you 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 don't you need to think the world is yours. You can do whatever. There's nothing you can't do. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times people just don't know what the difference is. Sometimes in today's world, I think that's gotten lost. I think people replace a million followers and think somebody's a star. That's not, that's not the case. What you are is popular on social media. Sweetie, popular on social media. Can't sell out a room on tour. Yeah. Like, there, there, it's very real. There's a bunch of artists out here that got 400,000 followers, but can do a 30 city tour and sell it out. Maybe not arenas, but the right size venue because they got their 400,000 fans want to be in the room with them when they hit that city. You got artists on social media now, three, four, five million followers on Instagram and stuff like that. They couldn't fill up a bar. People are interested in seeing what you're doing in their box and on their phone and stuff, but they're interested enough to buy a ticket and want to go and see what you, you perform, music or whatever. That to me is, is kind of the difference of where we are today. We're not making stars today. We're producing, we're really focused on selling singles. We don't care about the artists anymore. So let me ask you, cause, cause that's a great way to look at it. Can you tell a star from the gate? Is that something that's evident with or without a record? Or does that star quality come out once this person has a hit record? So there are those that say stars are born. And there are those that say stars are made. Um, I think Mariah Carey is a star um, that was made, though a star because she had Tommy who told her she had a, she had talent. It's not we're not. We're, and when I say this, I'm not talking about people's talent. I'm talking about she was married to the head of the label who put all the marketing dollars behind her, pushed her. She had the talent to match money, talent, superstar made, right? Janelle Monet was a star when we first met her. Outcast signed her long before the Janelle Monet that you guys saw. We, you could tell she was a star. 
we didn't get a chance to grow it. Atlantic Records put money, star, Janelle Monet, global superstar. Some people have made stars. Some people are just stars and it's just a matter of the world and everybody catching up. Some those, those little Michael Jacksons of the world. You knew he was a star from poor and it was just a matter of the world catching up. Prince knew he was a star even in his own head in high school. And me like, yeah. so I think everybody's journey to stardom is, is different. And everybody's not comfortable being a star, which is a lot of times the biggest stars are uncomfortable being stars. They don't want it. They didn't, it's not what they ask for. It's just what they are. And then there's this, this, the special type of star. The star that's going to outwork everybody. And that's what makes them a bigger star. Beyonce, Kevin Hart, The Rock, they're going to outwork everybody. Jennifer Lopez, but they're not maybe even the most talented. I remember Cat Cat Williams, Kevin Hart, and D Ray are were managed by the same person before they had all broke. And even at the time, you could be like, "All right, he's the most naturally funny, but he's going to outwork everybody." And as it's played out, that's kind of Cat is still to me the, the funniest and the most natural star in that. Cat walks in the room. It's on and popping for the minute he walks into me, walks out. Kevin, when he walks in the room, he turns it on better than anybody. So Kevin Hart's star is going to click and he's going to give you, he's going to give that room what they need out of him. And then he's going to go into five more rooms and do the same thing and get the bag out of it. Cat's like, I'm doing this shit once today. <laughs> he's going to be once and then I'm going about my motherfucking business. And it's kind of like that to me. That's what I've, I've seen that certain people are just naturally stars. And, and, and when you get lucky enough to have a star, it's your job to, to squeeze everything you can out of it. So is there any stars that you just missed but had the opportunity to work with? Oh, um, <laughs> I tell people, yeah, shit's happened. Drake is probably the biggest. Um, you had the opportunity but I didn't to miss. work with Drake? I had the opportunity to work with Drake. But I didn't miss it. And I tell people, this is another example of stars can be made. I met Aubrey. I met the kid straight out of Degrassi. That's who came to my office. He came to the office with my man, Tony Perez, introduced me to him. There was no Drake there. It was Aubrey. It was a kid that had been an actor in Toronto who just landed in New York that wanted to have a music career. What the world meant later was Drake, who took some of the young money swag, and the cash money swag and some of Wayne style and some of he had gotten, he collected. She fast forward three years, that Drake is not the same Aubrey that I met. So that's what I'm saying. Things can change based on your environment. It's like, it's like the old age question, nature or nurture. If the head of your label believes in you and they're going to nurture you, then you're gonna you can get further along if you're willing to do it. I, perfect example. I, I will keep this is a story. I will keep it short and sweet. I managed Life Jennings on Life's first album when he first got out. Signed to the same label as John Legend. All right, John Legend signed to Kanye West, the golden child in the building. Anything he needed, he needed a band for a TV performance. He needed they needed to take care of Kanye, so Kanye will come and be on TV with him. John Legend got everything he needed in that album. And Life Jennings was the little engine that could. And we went and got a van and we went to venues and we toured and we sold and we, Life sang, any place he pulled out his guitar, he was ready to sing and do his thing. And I tell people, if you go back and you look at how much they both sold on their first albums, Life sold like one three, John Legend only sold like one five. And he had the entire labels pushed behind him. But life was willing to outwork and do the work. And he connected with fans at a slower clip, but he still got to the same place. So that's nature. Life's willingness, his natural star ability, his willingness to work, and his team pushing. Versus kind of nurture, which is the label. Saw John. Kanye said, saw the talent. They had Kanye to work with. John's ability, and then they nurtured it by spending money to get him on stuff. So, yeah, I have passed, I have missed. Drake is the biggest artist that I would say I passed on, 
But I always say I didn't meet Drake. I met Aubrey. And you literally passed on it. Like, yo, I just don't see this. It was, you know, it wasn't that I passed like I'm not messing with it. I was busy with a lot of other artists at the time. And mm-hmm. I didn't have anybody in on my team at the time that was like, yo, I'm going to take this kid and run with it and, and go. Again, the style wasn't, it wasn't even the same rapping style. It wasn't the cadence. None of that was there. He didn't even have any real records like that. Remember, he's a great writer, so he had written some great stuff that got Tony's attention. But all that swag and shit, nah, you, there was none, none of that. <laughs> there was none of that. that. I'm telling you, that Young Money boot camp, that, those two years down there in Houston and New Orleans and all that, that's where Drake was born. Crazy. Yeah, if he to come back up to New York, I'd be like, yeah, I see it now. <laughs> Nah, that's a crazy story. You know, what leads me to another question. You know, for, for a seasoned manager like yourself, or even when you was coming up, what is your pitch? How, how do you get these artists? Is it referrals? Are you are you actively seeking them out? How, how, how does any manager acquire, acquire real talent? So as a manager, there's a couple of different ways. Um, some managers are really close to like a and is in the head of the label. And so they recommend, as they get ready to sign somebody, they might recommend. Um, a lot of times lawyers are going to like recommend you or put you in a room to, to see. Um, sometimes producers be like, yo, I got this artist. I need some help. Can you help me do it? And so a lot of your work is referrals. Sometimes it's you hearing about an artist or seeing an artist and you reaching out to them. Um, so I never take artists from anybody. So if I hear about you and you got an artist, I'm not, you know, if it's supposed to happen, it's going to happen. Sometimes I reach out, might be interested, and I see the talent and see what's up, and then that's it. Um, the pitch changes. When I was at Flavor Unit, the pitch was, we are Flavor Unit. That was enough of a pitch. Um, when I started Family Tree, I had Outcast and I had Donnell, and I had Reputation, and I knew everybody because I'd been – Flavor you in on the road and stuff. So I was I was the hot dude. And so lawyers and labels and people were calling me. Um, as you get really big, sometimes you don't get as many calls because people see your company's crowded. Like, it's a cycle you go through. You start as a little manager. You got one or two artists. Then you mess around and get really hot. Then you got a dozen artists. But now you're paying, you're paying attention to the top two or three that are paying the bills. And the bottom three are the ones that want the most attention um, because they want to be the top three. And eventually that's how management companies fall off or they lose clients. Um, and then sometimes you experience a fall off and then you have to get on the phone, call lawyers, call business managers, call people and be like, yo, I'm looking for some new artists. If anybody crosses your path that you think like our styles might match and you go. In terms of my pitch, my pitch arrogantly at this point is I'm who I am. You know who I am. You can see what I've done. I also can tell an artist, if you check my clients in my roster, none of my artists have ever had to sell out. You know, you've seen none of my artists have ever had to give up, like, their vision. CeeLo was able, I put CeeLo on a stage in a fucking bird suit. Like, creatively, rocking with me, we're going to get your vision. It's going to be as close to your vision as you want it to be. Um, I'm never going to ask you to sell out. Um, but I also think because I started and I've touched every part of this job, every aspect of, of management and I've been doing it long enough that if I sit with an artist and we can connect, I'm pretty confident usually that I will get that artist. That's just who I am. I believe that if you put me in a room with any artist that's honestly looking for good management, I can get them. If you, if you, if there's no one hating on me after I leave the room, because sometimes the production company hates Lawyer might be mad because I like we had got a fight over an artist. You got since you can't control, you can't control. But pound for pound, if you put me in a room with any other manager to try and get an artist, I feel I'm as good as anybody in the game. Only person that I got to be like, God damn it, is Irving. Anybody else, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> if I was white, I'd be. If I was white, I'd be Scooter Braun and Irving is off with the things that I've done in this game. And I'm not. I'm a six That's five black tough. man that don't play the games, and I'm not going to be played with. So I'm nowhere near, and I threaten people like we talked about. I'm a threat. Every people, for some reason, we seem locked in giving out these predatory deals to artists, and I'm going to break that deal up. If I manage your artist and you gave him a whack deal, I'm going to get, once we get some success, I'm coming back in, and I'm getting them off this fuck contract. That's what I've been telling. I, that's who I am. So 
if you're a production company and you know all your contracts are whack, you're never going to call me. So I'm never going to manage artists for certain labels and places because you know what the hell I'm going to do. I'm fine with that. I'd rather that be my reputation than to be somebody knowing that the, that the labels can manipulate and control and will sell his artists out. Fuck that. I'm not who that is. I, like you, we're from the Bronx. That ain't who we do. That's not how we do shit. So That's right. at the end of the day, I have to always be able to go back to the Bronx. That's always been my driving force. If everything in this industry went wrong, I can always go back to Cedric Avenue because I'm the same guy I was when I left. You know, for, for you, you know, and, and this is obviously it's a personal question, but I, I'm thinking again about somebody who might be watching this and want to mm-hmm. be you. Uh, is it easier for you to work with artists that you have before they become famous or inheriting an artist and taking their career to the next level after they had a level of fame? I think today's blue we, is easy. So I, honestly, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of inheriting artists because usually they've learned some bad habits from, habits from subpar managers. I am more of a fan of co-management of a young manager that's got things going and he's looked up and now he's in the rooms with Sylvia's and all these people and he feels a little overwhelmed and needs some help or some advice, all that. You can shine, kid. Get it. My ego does not require me to shine. You can be the one out front. People can do it. You talk to me. We'll figure out and strategize. When you need me to make the big calls, boom, I'll make the calls so we can get shit done. That's me now. Young Blue, I run through buildings. I was Superman. I didn't, like, put everybody on my back and I'm going to carry us to the finish line because that was my mentality. So when you're young, and you got the energy and the drive, go, go hard. Like work your hours, put in your grind. That's what, those are going to not only be the toughest time, but they're the best time because that's where you're built at. Be smart enough to know if you need some help. If you don't want to go to a manager because you're scared, you're going to lose your hours or whatever, get you a good lawyer. But you need somebody else smart in the room with you. I was blessed that I had Chuck Kim in the room. I had access to Chris Lighty. I had access to Leo Cohen. And I wasn't scared to ask questions. Shaquem's best trait was that he basically had a no question is too dumb policy. So I could walk upstairs, knock on his door, ask a question. Yeah, do it like that. Well, boom, after I've asked two or three questions and I start realizing the fourth time I might just try it on my own. Oh, shit, the fourth or fifth time I did it on my own, it worked. Now I'm offering money. Next time I go for him is going to be when I want to cross something new. Now I'll go back and ask another question. Shaquem was never insecure, so he never had a problem answering and telling me the question, the answers, because he knew I was going to take the knowledge and run downstairs and go do a better job for the company. You have to be, you have to take people where you find them, I would say. And if you're a young manager right now, your biggest, which you can't compete with me if you're a young manager is my experience and my relationship. You can't. You're not going to be able to out. But what you can is your 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 relationships and your understanding of where things are currently. Find your peers, find, find your class, as I like to say. Some of us came into business around the same time. This is our class. Yep. Paul manages Eminem, Mark Pitts, and I used to do pop shows together. Like some of us came in as Steve Rifkin. We kind of entered around the same time. That's my class. I'm able to reach out to those people. But if you come came in recently and you you know Tuma, who's head of Def Jam now, and you know certain people, that's your class. Make sure you got the relationship with your class before you even have to call me and my people and my class and stuff. Grow, get out there, shake hands, kiss the babies, like be be who you say you're gonna be. When you do get a client, communicate with the label, be visible. Don't just sit back and let it look like you're just waiting for checks to roll in. Get out there and be active. As you grow, figure out where you want to go also. Are you going to put all your eggs in just this one artist and that's going to be your path? Do you want to grow a management company of your own like I did? Or do you want to take your artist, go into a management company and get bigger resources and access and possibly get a check while you grow? It's like you kind of got to figure out what your lane is that works best for you and your personality. 
Everybody's not an entrepreneur. Everybody can't live check to check. Everybody can't live waiting for commission checks to come in. Shit's stressful. Artists have the shortest memory in the world. It's time to play commission check. Everybody gets stupid. Stuttering, <laughs> don't know what you're talking about. You got to chase down your check. you like, dog, really? So that's stressful for a lot of people. So everybody's not built for that. Some people are built to be at a company, get a check each week, get a bonus instead of commission, and work like that because they want to know that their check is going to be in a bank every Friday and they can do it. So you got to kind of judge where you are. Do you want to fly with no net or do you want a net? You know, kind of is everybody's personality. You know, I asked you this question, but I, I, I angled it toward artists. I, I, want, I want to talk about managers, executives, the people behind the scenes. You mentioned some of the greats. Irvin Azar, probably one of, if not the best to ever do it, the Scooter Bronze of the world. Uh, Chris Lighty, RIP. Um, Shaquem, another great manager yourself. What are some of the common traits that all of you guys have in common that you know from the gate when you're looking at young talent, this guy's got it. He's going to be one of the great managers in the game. Um, I think I think that you can sometimes you can see the hustle in you in, in a person. You can see they want it, and and you can kind of see nothing's going to stop it from happening. And if you're smart, and you're me, and you're smart, or you're shocking me, you're smart. You're like, yo, I'd rather have this kid on my team than competition because that's sometimes just just that like some managers grow within management companies they didn't come in off the street trying to be hired as a manager like mona love mona scott mona was chris's assistant and graduated to becoming president of flight violator and management because she learned how to manage being chris's assistant which made her good because she was and that's how she grew mine was different i came in off the street was told we're about to make you a manager so i was i learned how to be a manager by listening and from checking them and, and I'd go sit in Leo's office and stuff like that. But I think when you're looking at the next kid that wants to be a manager, you got to see that eye of the tiger. You need to see that he's willing to go harder. He's willing to run through a building for his artists. No isn't going to be no. Um, I have a gentleman, Justin Lamont. Um, Justin hit me on Twitter one day. This is 15 years ago now, probably. Justin said, I'm graduating from Howard. Um, I, I, I know who you are. I want to figure out how I could work for you, blah, blah, blah. Hear him back. You know, come by the office, such and such. Sit down, let's see. Maybe we can get you an internship. Justin takes the train from D.C. up to New York to meet with me on whatever day I told him I was going to be there. I forgot. Kind of like I messed up us and I was hitting you yesterday. I completely uh-huh, forgot uh-huh. the days. And so I'm in L.A. Justin's in my office in New York. My sister's like, some boy, some kid named Justin's here. Well, Justin, for when he said he hit you on Twitter. I was like, oh, snap. Shorty, I told him to meet me, right? I said, y'all interview him, and then I'll interview him when I come back. Hung up. They interviewed him. When I got back, I said, yo, what happened to the kid? How was he? They was like, he's really impressive. Good kid. He graduated school. Blah, blah, blah. He comes back up. I sit with him. I'm the same impression. Good young kid. He's got some fire to him. He's willing, obviously, to do the work. He got on the train up here a couple of times to come meet with me. I'm like, I gave him a job as an intern. He went from intern to assistant. At a point, I left the company that he was at, that I was at. I left, he left when I left. Um, he had found an artist, and I didn't get it. It was his artist. He was like, I got this artist. I'm working on it. I was like, all right, let me know anything I can do. He wasn't on me to do everything. He just was letting me know I got an artist I believe in. See, the difference between a lot of these young kids and even Justin and, and, and even some of his managers, I'm a resource. I'm not the person that has to do the work. Don't come to me thinking I'm going to do the work that you should be doing for your artists. Do, you need to do the work. You need to get out there and cake some nose. You need to get out there and be in the studio. You need to be out there and do something. Get it from zero to two or something before you come talk to me. Just took it from zero to like eight before he even explained who Ari Lennox was and this artist that he had found and that he had developed 
and he went and got a deal and got J. Cole to sign, and now she was signed in the scope. And he did it from the ground up. And he managed, he 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 created the Ari Lennox um business and made her a star and everything. I can't say the day I met him, I saw he was going to be that, but I saw he had that hustle in him and he was willing to do the work. And when he got an opportunity, he did the work. And now Justin is a young version of me out there making deals, doing, managing artists. He's, he's a legitimate manager. That's dope. So, I love that story. That's dope. You know, before and every assistant I've ever had is a manager. Every assistant I've ever had Every assistant I've ever had, not every, 80%, 85% of the assistants, and I, I, I say assistants because I'm old and that's the word we use, but I also used to like to call them my managers. They've all left to go and do either management or start their own businesses or whatever, because my job is not to hold you back. My job is to get you to help me be a better me while we work together. But while we're doing that, can I help you be the you you want to be? Because again, that's what we started with. If you each become something, my tree is bigger. And I get to reap the fruits of your success later because we all fall off at some point. And how far you fall is based on how you treat people while you're on the top. If you are a piece of shit while you are rising, when you fall off, people will look and watch you fall down. And listen, you go thump. But if you're a real person, if people really fuck with you and you've been good spirited and they want you to do well, someone will stick an arm out and your fall won't be as bad. They'll catch you. They'll throw you an artist. They'll throw you a consulting check. They'll throw your name in a room that you're not in. But that starts with how you treat people and whether you're open to letting people grow and giving them the support they need or are you an asshole who don't talk to nobody when you go in the building or don't know how to apologize when you, you curse somebody out, but it wasn't that tight. Then the fall is, is longer. I've, I've been hot, I've been cold, I've been hot, I've been cold. But I survived because even when I'm ice cold, I still get phone calls. Somebody's gonna call me about something. Am I excited about it? Do I wanna manage? Maybe not. Maybe that's not the look for me, but I gotta appreciate the fact that I got the call. Somebody thought enough of me, our relationship, or the work that I've done that they wanted to call me to work with somebody they had or they, or they want me to work with talent that they thought needed a good manager. That's, that's really what you want to be as a manager. You want to be somebody that people fuck with, that people recommend, that people say, yo, he's a good person to go rock with. And then it's, just, then it's back on you. Can you do the job stuff? You know, that's kind of where I wanted to close this interview out. And I was going to ask you, you know, what advice would you give to a young exec? What advice would you give to a young manager? But it feels like you just said it because it, it, it begins and ends with treating people the way you want to be treated, doing the hard work. Those things come back to you. Those th and, and, and what people don't realize in this game, the music industry is this small. Yeah. Everybody knows everybody. And I love your humility by saying, I've been hot, I've been cold, I've been hot, I've been cold, and I've been hot again. But the reason you yeah. keep getting chances is because when you were hot, you did right by people. Your name is everything in this game. And I don't think people understand that. People think that I got the hot hand and it's going to last forever. Right yeah, now, I'm attached to the, to the hottest artist on planet Earth. This artist is Fish Grease. It don't last forever. But your name and your reputation does. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what's going to either keep you working or have you looking for another job or, or I'm doing real estate now, which mm -hmm. everybody from the industry seems to do <laughs> once they leave. Uh, everybody goes cold. into the fucking, that's the problem with management. I will say this. The problem with management is there's no barrier of entry. Meaning no. anybody can pick up a, a, a phone and say they're a manager. And 
it sucks because every industry person, when they lose their job, like falls back in, they're going to start managing. And it's kind of insulting to real managers because y'all think y'all can just hop in and do this. And I watch them mess up careers because the thing about management is you, you are playing with someone's dream. You, you really got to understand that for you, it might just be a job or somebody you're picking up or a check, whatever, however you look at it. But it is somebody's dream. And so I think they deserve a certain amount of respect and, and, and real effort if you're going to do it and not something you're practicing or playing with. So your name, your reputation, um, they mean things. If you're new, if you're trying to figure out how to do this, go sit and meet people. Take the rejections. Everybody's not going to sit with you. You might want to go sit with with one of the top lawyers at a firm. And he don't know you and he ain't got time and he ain't going to sit with you. But you might be able to sit with one of the smaller lawyers at the firm who just got there. And now you and him kind of both starting at the same time. Build your relationship with him. When he starts to get hot, he might send you clients. You start to get hot, you might send him clients. You guys can look up and y'all can be 20 years having been doing business together. May go five or six without talking or doing business. But one day you get an artist and you're like, yo, they need a good lawyer. And you're like, I know who's a good lawyer. And you call him. That works with everything. Promoters, radio people, lawyers, everything that you come across in this industry, you kind of got to build your reputation. Now, it's hard to be cool with everyone or be on point with everyone. For example, me, I know who a bunch of the heads of, of the record, like of the radio stations are. And I know them because I've been doing this as long as they know me. But I didn't always nurture that relationship because I was fortunate and blessed to have great promo people working um, on my project, especially in the Lionel's. Lionel Rittenauer, um, just all of them, like all these dope promo people that they were good at what they did with radio. And we talked. So they was like, yo, we need to do this for this station. We need to do that. And I trusted them because radio was one more beast I didn't need to, I wasn't trying to take on. I knew all the people on touring. I knew all lawyers. I knew, I knew other areas. Boom. Radio, I kind of trusted. Some people in natural relationships with radio people, boom, work in your radio relationships. But if you're a new manager, get out there. Go places. Read magazines. Don't just read the blogs. Understand the numbers. This is a digital game now. Understand, like, know how much Spotify pays, know how much YouTube pays. Understand, because knowledge is power as a manager. Because your artist is going to have a lot of questions. And if you get, if your artist keeps asking you questions and you don't know no answers, he's mm -hmm. going to lose faith. And you don't never have no answers, then why am I with you? And then he's going to talk to someone who either really knows the answers or bullshit's way through the answers, but you're going to look like you just ain't know. So even when you don't have an artist, even when you're not hard, even when you're trying to learn who the players are, learn who's out here, who's making moves, who's signing, who's not signing, who do you need to know at iHeart? It should be a constant education as a manager. You as a manager should never stop learning. This business evolves. You need to be involved with it. There's a change coming. You need to know how to be see that change and either position your artist or yourself to be on the, on the cusp of that, whatever. But this isn't just about, oh, I got an artist and it's getting them a deal and then the money's gone.
you're doing probably more work today or just about as much work with as with the least amount of support from a label structure than ever. So before you start claiming your manager, or before you, you think this shit is a game, study, figure out what it takes. Do you have what it takes? Is it what you really want? Are you ready to, to swing without a net? Or do you need to find a building to get into and get you a check? It's a lot of self-reflection, I think, as a manager you should take before you become one, as opposed to just jumping in and thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Some people get lucky. I know some idiots that are managers. They would just stand in the right place when the artist got hot and the artist trusted them and the label protects them because the label just tells the manager what they're going to do and the manager goes, okay, I'm going to ask him. And then the artist says, okay, and the manager just sort of gets to ride along for success. You might get lucky, and there have been people, a lot of artists and managers I've seen get like that. It doesn't last, though. It doesn't. It's not going to last a long time. Eventually, either you're going to get exposed or the label's going to decide that that artist needs a bigger manager that knows more. And then those same people that were protecting you are going to become the snakes that are getting you out the door. So if you're not educating yourself, if you're not reading, if you're not reading the trades, if you're not reading, fuck these blogs, but reading things that really can also give you some business knowledge and understanding and perspective, then then you're losing to somebody that's hungrier than you that is doing that. I mean, you just dropped so much wisdom and so much knowledge, man. We ended there. Like, I, I almost don't know where to go because <laughs> you just said a mouthful. And if anybody, if they didn't hear nothing else you said, Blue, understand something. This is not the 80s. It's not the 90s. It's not even early 2000s. The labels <clears throat> do nothing these days. You have to build yourself. The labels are jumping after but they're mm-hmm. looking at you to build yourself. And if you mm-hmm. don't have a great team behind you, if you don't have people that are ready to run through walls for you, if you don't have people who understand the game, and if they don't understand it, they're willing to put in the work to understand it, mm-hmm. you, you're going to be one of, of, of the millions of talented wannabe artists out there that the world has never heard. But Blue, I appreciate you joining me this week, kid. Uh, you Man, thank you for having me. And, 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 and I know people, somebody out there is going to benefit from it. That's all I can hope, man. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. We got to do this again, brother. Anytime, sir. Anytime, bro. My man. Thank you. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.